I would like to introduce Jacques Schumacher now, a provenance curator at the Victorian Albert Museum. And uh, Jacques holds a PhD in history from the University of Oxford. And he's also a member of the National Museum Directors Council Spoliation Working Group, which coordinates provenance research efforts at UK museums with respect to the Nazi period. And he's also a member of the Arts Council England Restitution Working Group, which advises on the development of new guidance for the UK museum sector with respect to colonial era artifacts. So then a warm welcome to Jacques Schumacher. Um, and I will give the floor to you. Brilliant, Gabriella. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. As Gabriella has mentioned, I'm the provenance curator at the Victorian Albert Museum in London. The Victorian Albert Museum was established in the 1850s, and since then the collection has grown to more than 2 million items. And not only is the collection extremely large, it's also incredibly diverse. It includes a wide range of different items, ranging from paintings to drawings to sculptures to textiles, fashion, furniture. In fact, it's quite difficult to imagine an item that's not in the collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum. And that's because the museum was set up to, the, to, to collect examples of good design. And because the collection is so large and diverse, it's very well suited to allow us to explore various questions of provenance research and the politics surrounding it. I mentioned that the museum was established in the 1850s, and this means that the majority of the collection was built during a time when the standards for collecting were very different than they, than they are today. Our values regarding collecting have changed significantly, of course, since the 19th century, but the objects are still there and the museum continues to acquire objects, which is why it's very important to think about the ethical and legal standards that we apply to these new acquisitions. So today um, I would like to use several case studies to explore these issues with you. And so there are three areas that I want to talk to you today. Um, in particular, and these are, so the first group of objects are archaeological objects, which can be very, very difficult to research. And I will talk about the history of this 4,250 years old Anatolian gold ewer, which we recently returned to Turkey. And then I will talk about ob objects which have an unclear provenance with respect to the Nazi period, which even after more than 75 years after the end of the Second World War is still a topic of major concern for museums. So I will talk about this clock and other objects with a concerning provenance. And finally, I will talk about objects which came to the museum as a result of British military campaigns in the 19th century. And I will focus on this gold crown, which was looted from the treasury of the Ethiopian ruler Tivotos II in 1868, so shortly after the museum was founded. And in each case, I will explain how their provenance became an issue for museum, outline the policy issues surrounding them, and highlight the challenges involved in researching their history. And these case studies are relevant for anyone who wants to um, think about researching existing collections, but they are also relevant for anyone thinking about acquiring such objects or accepting such such objects as a loan, for example, for an exhibition. Because in both cases, the research methods are always the same. And the goal of provenance research is actually very, very simple. It is to clarify who owned an object in the past. And in an ideal world, we would like to know the complete provenance of an object from the point of creation to the present day when it entered a museum collection or when it is being offered to a museum as a new acquisitions. And there are generally two ways of doing this. We can start from the point of creation and then 
trace our way forwards in time, or we can start with the ob in the here and now at the museum with the object and then try to trace our way backwards in time. So I would like to talk about the oldest items first. And I said that the provenance of archaeological items can be particularly difficult to research. And the reason for this is that in many cases, their discovery was not documented. And if the objects are from abroad, this provenance research can be very, very political. And to explore these issues with you, I would like to use this gold ewer, which is 4,250 years old and which has been attributed to the Hattians who lived in Anatolia. It came to the museum, the VNA, in 2008, but it is no longer there. And it's no longer there because we researched its provenance. Um, two months ago, we returned the ewer to Turkey in an official handover ceremony. So you can see us there with the Turkish Ministry um, of Culture. And it is now on display in the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations in Ankara. And it looks absolutely fantastic there. And this was the outcome of a research project and collaboration that lasted several years. It was highly confidential throughout this whole time. I was never allowed to talk to anyone about this. And I'm very pleased that I'm finally able to share publicly um, this research and what motivated the return of this object. So this is a first for me. It's the first time that I can talk about this. So I thought it would make sense to start at the beginning. I will talk about how this UR came to the VNA, the provenance research into its origins, and then the complex factors that led to its return to Turkey. As I mentioned, the UR came to the VNA in 2008. It was placed on loan to the museum from a private foundation. It was in fact part of a larger collection in which it was the only archaeological item. All of the other items in this large collection that it was a part of were created much later. They were all European or British works of decorative art. And a part of this collection was also this clock here, which I will use later on to explore the questions of Nazi era provenance. So this collection that this clock and many other items of decorative art were part of was put together by a private collector called Arthur Gilbert. He was born in London in 1913. And then after the Second World War, Arthur Gilbert became a very, very successful real estate developer in Los Angeles, which is where he started collecting in the 1960s. He collected micro mosaics, then Italian hardstone mosaics. Then he became interested in gold boxes and then um, in a wide range of items of gold and silver. You can see him here with, an, with a silver dish, but he also collected portrait miniatures. And in most cases, we have very little information about who owned these items before they were acquired by Arthur Gilbert. And when I first opened the file um, with respect to the ewer, I learned that Arthur Gilbert had acquired it in 1989 in Los Angeles from an antiquities dealer. And I think we can all imagine how mesmerized Arthur Gilbert must have been when he first saw this ewer in this antique shop. He was told that it was created by a goldsmith who lived more than 4,000 years ago and who worked this from a single sheet of paper and then beautifully decorated it. And he was also told that this goldsmith had made this ewer so that the ewer would accompany a Hattian ruler into the afterlife. And he found this to be a very evocative story that sort of added to the appeal of this object. Arthur Gilbert was primarily interested in objects, but he was also interested in their history of ownership, especially if the um, history of ownership or provenance was prestigious. So he did ask this dealer about the provenance of the ewer, and the dealer told Arthur Gilbert that the ewer had previously been in a private collection in Switzerland. And the dealer showed Arthur Gilbert a provenance statement which stated that this private collector had bought the ewer from a private person in Europe in the 1960s. And the year, nine, oh, the decade, the 1960s will become important later on. So with this information, Arthur Gilbert acquired the ewer and added, this, added it to his collection. 
but within the collection, you were always occupied an outsider status because it was the only archaeological object. It was, in fact, never on public display at the Victoria and Albert Museum, um, which I find very surprising because obviously an enormously important object. There are very few of its kind. So when I looked at the acquisition file in 2019, I had access to more information than Arthur Gilbert when he bought it. We now know that the dealer who sold the ewer to Arthur Gilbert was secretly involved in the trade of illicit antiquities. This means that he sold objects which had been illegally excavated and exported from their countries of origin. We now also know that the private Swiss collector who allegedly owned the ewer before it was sold to Arthur Gilbert was also involved in, this, in the trade of illicit antiquities. He was in fact a restorer who lived in Zurich, who on several occasions had provided false provenance statements to public and private collections who then acquired pieces which then had to be restituted. So several museums had in fact had to restitute items with exactly the same provenance. What added to this was that in 2003 the dealer who sold Arthur Gilbert this year um, he, ser he had served a prison sentence and afterwards he provided, um, he published a tell-all memoir in which he talked about his involvement in this shadowy trade. And in this book, he also revealed that his main supplier was another antiquities dealer who was also involved in the trade of illicit antiquities. So at this stage of the research, we knew that Arthur Gilbert had acquired an object which likely came from Turkey. And we knew that every single person who was connected to this object before Arthur Gilbert touched it was involved in the trade of illicit antiquities. And so with this in mind, I think that it is very important to take a step back and to look at the implications of this research, to look at the policies surrounding the acquisition of such objects. In the past, so so in, in the 19th century and the early 20th century, museums like the VNA did not see it as their responsibility to pay attention to the cultural heritage protection laws or export laws of foreign countries. And this changed when in the 1960s, several countries, and this included Turkey, petitioned UNESCO to do something about the illegal exodus of cultural property from their countries. And they argued that to combat this effectively, two things had to happen. So first of all, the countries, these countries had to step up their cultural heritage protection efforts and to prevent these objects from leaving their countries. But these countries also pointed out that this demand for illegal objects was driven by collectors and museums in the West. So they proposed that in order to, um, to uh, quell this demand for illegal artifacts, the destination countries should also do something. So in the 19, in 19, in, uh, 1970, UNESCO passed a convention which had a profound impact on the museum sector. And this convention called upon Western countries to put mechanisms in place to prevent their museums from becoming the repositories for such items. This meant that museums now suddenly had to pay attention to the export laws of the countries from which uh, the pieces that they wanted to add to their collections originated. Okay, so for museums in the UK, this means that if a museum like the VNA wants to acquire or borrow an item like the Ewer, it has to be certain of two things. It has to be certain or of, of, of two things. It has to be certain that either that the object had left its country of origin before 1970, which is when the UNESCO Convention was passed, or it has to be certain that if the object left its country of origin after 1970, that this happened legally. In other words, the UNESCO Convention introduced 1970 as the threshold which required museums to pay close attention to the provenance and to carry out due diligence for new acquisitions. And this 1970 threshold um, is echoed in various sector codes of ethics, such as the ICOM Code of Ethics, or here in the UK, the Museum Association's Code of Ethics. But it's also part of our collections policy, which requires us 
to carry out due diligence, which means that we ask questions about the provenance of the items that we add to the collection. And if a museum has any doubts about the legal or moral status of the objects, it cannot, the objects cannot come to the museum. And if the item is already there on loan, like the ewer, then this loan has to be terminated and the object has to be returned to the lender. And this is the policy background, which is crucial to understanding um, of what happened next, which then resulted in the return of the ewer. So at this, at this stage of the research, we knew that the ewer came from a problematic source. Crucially, we had a provenance statement from this Swiss collector who said that the ewer was out of its country of origin when he allegedly acquired it in the 1960s. And I don't think that this is a coincidence that this private collector said that he had acquired the ewer outside Turkey in the 1960s. So it was conveniently before the 1970 UNESCO Convention was introduced. And when we conduct this provenance research, we usually work our way backwards in time. And in this case, our research stopped with the Swiss collector because he did not name the person who allegedly sold the ewer to him. So we had no further leads for our research. The other way of conducting provenance research is to start from the object um, and its point of creation, so which in this case was more than 4,000 years ago. The problem here was now that the ewer's discovery was not documented. And this distinguishes it from other similar ewers which were discovered in orderly archaeological excavations. In the 1930s, archaeologists discovered two very similar golden ewers in royal tombs. And these two golden ewers then subsequently entered the collections of the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations in Ankara. So at this stage of the research, the attribution of the Gilbert ewer to the Hattian people rested solely on a stylistic comparison so that Researchers thought that because of these comparisons, this must mean that they also belong to the same people and the same time period. And the reason why an object that was illegally or potentially illegally excavated, that its discovery was not documented, is of course that the people who do this have no interest in documenting their activities. So it was clear to us that we would not be able to reliably reconstruct the provenance of the ewer for the time before it was acquired by Arthur Gilbert. But because of the question marks over its provenance, the VNA made the decision to terminate the loan and to return the ewer to the lender. And this lender was the Gilbert Trust for the Arts, a private foundation which was set up to ensure the public display of the Gilbert collection. And it was this Gilbert Trust which instructed me to make contact with the Turkish Ministry of Culture. And I have to say that it was the beginning of a very positive research collaboration. And crucially, we were able to confirm that the ewer which Arthur Gilbert had bought was actually an authentic piece of Hattian metalwork. So we were able to compare the composition, the alloy of this, of, of the Gilbert ewer to the two ewers in the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations in Ankara. So this confirmed to us that the piece was authentic, which we didn't, didn't know until this um, point. So in light of this confirmation, the Gilbert Trust had to consider um, a wide range of different factors. So we knew that it would be impossible to conclusively resolve the provenance of these objects. We knew that there were a lot of red flags there. So nothing in the US provenance suggested that the US was legitimately sourced. The fact was also that the loan had was terminated and that the ewer was in storage. And the Gilbert Trust did not want to keep the ewer in storage because it's their desire to share this collection with the world. And it was also clear that with this provenance, no other museum that has any due diligence standards would be able to accept this object either. So it would not be able to join other items from the Gilbert collection, which are on display, for example, at the moment in Los Angeles in, 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 um, and, and other countries. So it was against this background that the Gilbert Trust made the decision to donate, to gift the ewer to the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations in Ankara. And here's a photo um, from the handover ceremony, uh, which I think gives you sort of a real sense of the public interest in this return. 
And I think that the decision to return this object um, was a very sensible one. I don't think that this object should have ever come to the VNA. And the reason why it was ever at the VNA was that the due diligence that due diligence was conducted for the collection, but that this particular issue was overlooked in 2008 because the curators were focused on the 1000 other pieces and they were mainly concerned about Nazi era provenance, which is what I'll talk about later. Um, it's a very good outcome that it is now in the Museum of Anatolian Civilization. So it means that the UR for the first time in decades can actually go on public display. It's no longer hidden away in a box in a secure storage facility. Visitors are finally able to study and appreciate it again. And next to the UR, the museum in Ankara placed an object label which, which talks about the recent provenance and about the importance of provenance research and collaboration. So I think that this was a very, very positive outcome for the Gilbert Trust and for the museum. I mentioned that the UR was the only archaeological item in the collection, and I also said that it was never on public display, but nevertheless, its departure left a clear gap in the collection. It was clearly something that was important to Arthur Gilbert because otherwise he would not have acquired it. And the Gilbert Trust did not want the departure of the UR to be the end of the conversation. And they recognized the fact that in a museum, conversations are always sparked by the objects on display. And for this reason, they commissioned a contemporary uh, metalsmith, uh, Adi Tok, to create a piece that responds to the UR and its story. And she actually had a very authentic relationship with this object because although the object was never on public display, we used it in handling sessions at the museum and she frequently came to the museum to examine the object and she because she uses many of the same techniques and so she created this funnel which in fact uses the same alloy that was used um, for the ewer and it now is on display at the vna um, next to it is a computer terminal with a film that talks about provenance research due diligence and her artistic um, process and I hope that this piece will ensure that we will continue to have many interesting conversations about provenance research and due diligence at the museum. So with this example, I want to highlight the challenges involved in researching archaeological items. The major challenge is that the discovery of items um, was frequently not documented. And this can be because there was the items were a chance find. They were discovered outside um, an orderly archaeological excavation and there might be nothing wrong with it. They might have come from a time when when no, con no archaeological excavations were conducted in these countries and when the awareness of cultural heritage protection was generally very low or indeed um, because the items were illegally excavated and exported after 1970. So this can make it very difficult to clarify the provenance. And I think it's important to acknowledge that an element of uncertainty often remains. And if we have such an element of uncertainty, it's very important to honestly look at the facts that are available. So in the case of the UR, I think it would be very, very difficult to make the convincing case that um, retaining this object would be an ethical outcome of this research. And I also wanted to highlight what museums can do about such a provenance. And I think that the return of the UR was an excellent outcome for the Gilbert Trust and that the museum found a very thoughtful way to keep it present in the collection and to be honest about the reasons why this object was in the museum in the first place and the thought process that led to its departure so that our visitors can understand um, what restrictions museums are under and so that we can explain our actions. So after talking about a group that poses particular challenges, I want to move on to another group of items which present challenges that are not dissimilar, but slightly different. And these are objects with an unclear provenance with respect to the Nazi past. And I would also like to explore this using items uh, from the Gilbert collection because you're now already familiar with him. 
So I mentioned that Arthur Gilbert started collecting in the 1960s. This was a time when few collectors um, asked in-depth questions about provenance um, and specifically about the Nazi past. I should mention that Arthur Gilbert was the son of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe, so he was of course acutely aware of the horrors of the Holocaust, but even he did not ask in-depth questions about the items that he acquired. So we had this enormous collection of more than 1000 pieces and um, a largely unclear provenance. So my task was to go through this collection and to identify pieces which had belonged to Jewish collectors who had these items taken from them and to identify items that were not restituted after the Second World War. And when I started my research, in fact, I didn't know if there would be any pieces in this collection with a connection to the Nazi past. In most cases, all we had was an invoice which tells us which dealer or auction house sold the object to Arthur Gilbert. And this is an, a typical example of such an invoice. These invoices always provided information about the object, a description of the item, and in most cases, but not always, the name of the maker, the place of production, and the year. And this information was, of course, what mattered most to someone like Arthur Gilbert, who was, of course, primarily interested in the objects. So it was important for him to know who had made them, where and when. But he was also interested in provenance. He acquired many items um, with a particular, with a particularly prestigious um, history of ownership. These were items which had belonged to um, uh, aristocrats, um, or particularly influential collectors. And um, some have argued that Arthur Gilbert, um, because he had a comparatively modest uh, family background, more than other collectors enjoyed the cachet of a prestigious provenance so that by buying these pieces, he essentially signaled that he had sort of achieved the wealth and, and sophistication of a European king, for example. So he always had interest in provenance, but for him provenance was always something that was designed to enhance the value of a piece and not to identify potential problems. So if the provenance was missing, um, then he did not see this as a cause for concern. And I think that it is very important to point out that the lack of provenance is not always a sign that there's clearly something problematic um, about the object. It just means that there's a gap that we should aim to close and that might not always be possible. The type of object which he was interested in, the small precious object, often did not leave a paper trail waiting to be discovered by researchers in the archives. And if somebody had to sell them at auction, they did not necessarily want to draw attention to the fact that there were more items like this in their homes or that they were in a position where they were forced to sell these items at auctions. So for most of Arthur Gilbert's career as a collector, provenance, so the lack of a provenance was not seen as problematic. It was only towards the end of his career as a collector that this changed. The reason was for this was that in the 1990s there was enormous public attention on the fact that many of the artworks which had been confiscated or extorted from Jewish victims of the Nazis had not been restituted after the war. So a lack of provenance was now seen as something suspicious and something that needed to be clarified. I will talk about the way in which the idea of what provenance was for was transformed in the late 1990s and then imposed sort of various um, duties on, on museums. But for now, I want to stick with this example to highlight the challenges involved in this provenance research. The problem here is that once the provenance information has been lost, it is very difficult to reconstruct. There's no definitive list of objects which were looted under the Nazis. All we have are incomplete lists or databases which are incomplete. So if you start from the object and the very limited information in the files, the main challenge is finding out who this object belonged to during the Nazi period. So it's about trying to reunite the object and the very limited records, and in this case we only had this invoice, with archival records elsewhere which might enable us to explore what happened to this person during the Nazi period. So if they were Jewish and persecuted, for example. And in this case, I found a handwritten note in the research files, which stated that this box had belonged to somebody called G-R. 
and that was it. There was no further information. I don't think that without this this note, I would have been able to bridge this gap to the archives at all. So I only had these initials. Um, there was no further information, but I knew that there had been a prolific collector of works of decorative art in Germany called Maximilian von Goldschmidt Rothschild, and I believe that G hyphen R might be him, which turned out to be correct in the end. He had married into the Rothschild family, of course, the famous um, Jewish family. He had built an extraordinary wealth and then created an incredible collection of works of decorative art in Frankfurt am Main in Germany where he lived. But his collection had never been published, so there was no catalog that I could have looked at in the archives to quickly confirm the status of the object. So I went to the archives in Frankfurt and found an asset declaration, which Maximilian, like all German Jews, had to submit in 1938. And these asset declarations, they informed the Nazi authorities about what Jews owned, and they became effectively the blueprint for the dispossession of Jewish collectors. And as you can see here, this inventory is not very detailed. There are a lot of Louis um, gold boxes on there, but I'll give you um, a small hint. It's uh, the snuff box at the top of the page with the number 405 and a very, very um, short description. It doesn't even mention that on the box it says LM. Um, so I found this inventory and I also found out that in 1938 Maximilian was forced to sell his collection to the city of Frankfurt. And to achieve this aim, the Nazi mayor of Frankfurt took advantage of the events known as Kristallnacht, when um, Nazi activists and sympathizers attacked Jews in the streets and vandalized their businesses. And the Nazi mayor called Maximilian von Goldschmidt Rothschild's advisor threatened him with the destruction of the property and the outright theft of the collection. And it was then under this pressure that Maximilian agreed to sell the collection to the city of Frankfurt. And subsequently, the Nazi mayor called the, his museum directors, who then called their curators, and they went to Maximilian's residence to catalog the collection. And they created index cards in this process. But these index cards were not in the archive in Frankfurt, they were in a museum archive. So I contacted the Museum of Applied Arts in Frankfurt and um, my colleague Katharina Weiler shared with me the index card, which was created in 1938. You can see again the number 405, which means that this is the snuff box that was mentioned as 405 in the inventory. And you can immediately see that the description was incredibly detailed and that crucially this index card contained a photograph of the object. And it was this photograph which enables us to compare it to the box that was acquired by Arthur Gilbert without any information about the provenance and enabled us to confirm that this was the same object. So at this stage of the research, it was clear that the owner of this box was Jewish, that he was persecuted under the Nazis, and that he sold his collection to the city of Frankfurt in what can only be described as a forced sale, of course. So at this point, we had absolutely no idea how the box left the museum in Germany and went to the dealer who then sold it to Arthur Gilbert. In the archival records, I found that many of the objects which the museum had acquired um, were in fact exchanged by the museum for objects from elsewhere or they went missing during the uh, bombing of Frankfurt. But I found out that after the Second World War, Maximilian's grandson arrived with the American troops in Frankfurt and he demanded the restitution of the collection and the bulk of the collection was indeed restituted. But many objects, as I said, had gone missing or had been had left the museum in the meantime. So my question, so when, when looking at this box was, was this box restituted to the family after the war or was it one of the boxes which had gone missing? And in the archives, I found a list of objects which were restituted after the war. So this was essentially a receipt that was then signed by a representative of the family. And in this document, you can see the number 405 again, and this confirms that the object was restituted after the war. Um, so there's no issue with this, with this object from a restitution perspective. I will now take a step back and talk about the context in which this research takes place. 
Nazi era provenance has a special status in the UK. It is not something that museums themselves decided they should be doing. They were told to do so by the UK government. And what made this an issue for UK museums was a letter that Lord Jenner of Brownstone, the chairman of the Holocaust Educational Trust, sent to the Secretary of State for Culture, Chris Smith, in February 1998. In this letter, Lord Jenner pointed out that Nazi looted art was not just an issue that affected, as you might think, museums in Germany or museums in Nazi, formerly Nazi occupied territories, but even museums in America where problematic items had recently been discovered. So Lord Jenner asked the obvious question, if this was a major issue for American museums, then why should British museums be any different? So the Secretary of State asked the VNAs then director to address this possibility and shortly afterwards they received a letter that said that the US State Department was planning a major international conference about Jewish assets in Washington DC later this year. So UK, the UK's national museums, they drafted the policy statement which essentially said that they will conduct systematic provenance research into their existing collections but also into new acquisitions and loans. So they traveled to Washington with this policy statement and the outcome of the discussions in Washington was an 11 point statement which would set the agenda for museums and the question of provenance research was directly addressed by point one which stated that art that hadn't had been confiscated by the Nazis and not subsequently restituted should be identified. And in 1998 after they returned from the Washington conference curators in the UK for the first time started to look at their collections and their new acquisitions with the question of Nazi era provenance in mind. And in the past, when they were asked to look at um, problematic provenance, they were frequently asked to look at imperial spoils of war. So objects that had been captured by British troops during the 19th century. And in these cases, the museum's own records they told the story of how these museum uh, of how these objects had come to the museum but this was not the case when it came to nazi looted art in most cases all the museum was able to say was that they had acquired it in the 1960s 1970s or 1980s from a dealer or from a collector and when they continued to acquire objects this issue remained the same and this is where there's a clear difference between museums in the UK and, and other countries which were not directly affected by Nazi rule and museums in Germany because in Germany as we have seen with the example of the Maximilian von Goldschmidt Rothschild collection curators just recorded the provenance in their files but at the VNA the reality was that since the museum's foundation in the 1850s curators had always acquired objects without asking questions about their provenance. And this did not change in 1933 when the Nazis seized power. It did not change in 1939 when the German invasion of, of Poland triggered the Second World War. And it did not change after the Second War, World War. And it even did not change after former monumentsmen joined the museum. So I've mentioned that the museum has two million items in its collections. And there are hundreds of thousands of items with significant gaps in their provenance. And every time we acquire an object, we have to ask ourselves these questions about the provenance now. So I talked to you about a very fairly straightforward case, the snuff box, which was looted and then restituted. But I now want to talk about a very problematic, but ultimately unclear provenance. I want to talk about this magnificent clock, which Arthur Gilbert acquired in 1979 from an anonymous American collector. Anonymous means that the file doesn't tell us who he acquired it from. We now know that this clock was once in the collection of Nathan Ruben Frenkel. Nathan Ruben Frenkel was a clockmaker and collector of antique clocks who lived in Frankfurt am Main, where he died in 1909. And after his death, his children put together a catalog of his collection. And it was in this catalog that I found a photo of this highly unusual clock. So we do not know what happened to the clock after Nathan Ruben Frankel's death, uh, 
So we have a gap between the publication of this catalog in 1912 and the year in which it was acquired by Arthur Gilbert, so in 1979. But what we do know is that members of the Frankel family were persecuted under the Nazis. Friedrich Frankel and his wife Clara, they ran an incredibly successful clock shop in Frankfurt am Main. Um, they were even able to expand their business after the Nazis seized power. But then in 1935, all of this changed. German customers started to stay away. Wholesalers stopped making deliveries. They were no longer um, allowed to import clocks from Switzerland, for example. And they were forced to shut down their business and to sell all their stock. And their business was officially liquidated the week after Kristallnacht. And like all German Jews, the Frankels had to pay compensation for the damage that Nazi activists had caused to Jewish property. And they made the decision to leave the country. They decided that it would be safer to go to France. But before they were able to go to France, they had to um, submit an inventory which lists everything they owned. And the problem is here that the clock is not on this inventory. In France, of course, they were only safe until 1940. They survived the war in hiding, and when they returned to their Par Parisian apartment, all of their property had disappeared. So this is a case where we have an enormous gap. We have between 1912 and 1979, and we have an incredibly concerning story and an ultimately unresolved um, provenance. And Whenever we look at an object like this, we carry out certain checks and I've shared with Gabriella um, a handout which summarizes the key databases for you. So I won't go over all of them at once, but I think it's very important to recognize that many objects come with a incomplete and problematic provenance. And then the question is, what does a museum do about this? And in the past, I think that many museums would have preferred to stay silent about this. They would have said, in the case of the clock, for example, that there's no concrete evidence that it was ever looted, or they would have said that as an art museum, it's not in our area of expertise to talk about Nazi persecution. But at the VNA, we really wanted to highlight the experiences of Jewish collectors and talk to our visitors about the challenges involved in conducting provenance research, because I think for our visitors, it's often very difficult to understand how difficult and inconclusive this research can be. So we are used that they expect clear answers. They think that an unbroken chain of provenance should be the norm. So what we did for this exhibition, we left the objects in their original location. We even preserved the old label, which you can see at the top. But we included a new label which talks about the Jewish collector and what happened to them to bring attention to this unresolved provenance. And our hope was, of course, that by highlighting this, we would be able to resolve this issue. So I know that one of the questions that you probably ask yourself right now is, what happens if it is confirmed that this object was looted under the Nazis? And in the UK, there's a, there's a system that was set up that creates a very favorable environment for provenance research. The decision about the future of such items is made by an independent panel of experts who issue recommendations in response to restitution claims. And what this means is that we as curators can focus on researching and communicating um, this research to our visitors and we don't have to think about the sort of legal or sort of the we don't have to think about making a judgment call about whether this means that the object should be restituted. And if there's a claim, then this panel will assess the um, evidence. There's no one from the museum on this panel, so the decision is yeah, so it's as objective as it, as it can be. And the basis for this is the 2009 Holocaust Act, which talks broadly about um, uh, objects which were lost during the Nazi period. So to summarize this section, researching Nazi era provenance is a requirement for UK museums, like researching the origin of archaeological objects. In the case of Nazi looted art, the major challenge is that um, in the past, museums and collectors did not ask many questions about the provenance. But 
in most cases, we at least know that at some point the objects were in the collections of a Jewish family, for example. So it um, it is it can be easier in a way, but the challenge is, of course, when we have to conduct this due diligence under great time pressure, for example, because an object um, because the museum wants to acquire an object at an auction. So I've talked about archaeological objects, Nazi looted provenance issues, and I now want to talk about the third and, and final category of objects. And these are objects which are currently at the center of debates about the morality of museum collections. And this seems to happen every 20, 20 years that this becomes a major issues, issue for museums in the UK. So these are items or the, the most heated debate takes place around items which were taken by force by British troops during the 19th century. And again, I would like to take a concrete example to talk about the provenance issues and the policy issues surrounding it. So in 1868, the crown and the chalice, they were in the collection, uh, were in the treasury of the Ethiopian ruler Tewodros II. And I will first talk about how these items ended up in the collections of the VNA. So the background to this is that, in, that the Ethiopian ruler asked the British for military assistance to, in his fight against his enemies. And this letter remained unanswered. Un, un, unanswered. So Tewodros decided to take European hostages, and his idea was that this would prompt the British to support him. But of course, the opposite was the case, and the British sent a military mission to liberate the hostages and to send a strong signal that such conduct, which the British perceived as a humiliation, was unacceptable and would be punished. So the British swiftly defeated Tewodros' group and seized his mountain fortress of Magdala. And at the time, it was standard military practice for the British to seize the possessions of the defeated enemy. Um, and they often did this in order to be able to sell them later to recover the costs associated with the campaign. So numerous items from this campaign then ended up in museum collections. If the British Museum sent a representative to accompany the army, and um, it was this representative who picked the crown and chalice, but it ultimately ended up at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And when it arrived at the museum, the curators diligently recorded in their files where these objects had come from. And um, I think that is very important to remind ourselves of the fact that the way in which museums thought about these items was very different back then. So the fact that these items had been looted was not seen as a source of embarrassment, but on the contrary as something that ought to be celebrated. So when these objects were displayed in the galleries, it was always pointed out that they had been taken by force and in the museum guides, it always said that they um, were captured. And other items then came to the museum via the families of participants in the campaign. And they too proudly informed the museum that these were items which were associated with the Magdala campaign. And this is what makes the provenance research into this group of items much easier than the research into archaeological objects or objects which have an unclear provenance with respect to the Nazi period. Because in this case, the museum's own records do indeed hold all of the answers. And it's not only the museum records. There are many other items which were seized by British troops at the VNA, including items which were seized from the Old Summer Palace um, in Beijing uh, during the Opium Wars. Um, this cushion cover has a provenance attached to it. So I've said that the provenance research is easier, but the reality is also that the findings of this research raise much more difficult questions. And this is because there is no framework currently in place that would allow museums to resolve these issues. There has never been an equivalent to the Washington Conference, <clears throat> uh, which was on Holocaust um, on Nazi confiscated art. Um, and I explained that for Nazi looted art, the British government found a way to enable the restitution of these pieces from national collections, but the same does not apply to items which were looted by British troops during the 19th century. So what this means is that when in 2008, the Ethiopian president made a restitution claim, the museum 
could could only respond to this claim by offering to place the items on long term loan to Ethiopia. And this did not address the fundamental fact that the Ethiopian request was motivated by the, by the desire to get recognition for a past historical injustice. So it's currently unclear whether a similar law will be introduced in the UK that will enable museums to restitute not only Nazi looted art, but other items as well. And I think that it is also very important to point out that there's currently no directive or requirement for due diligence for such objects, which regularly um, appear at auction. I'm very conscious of the time, so I would suggest that I stop here. And I think that especially the way in which we treat Nazi looted items and colonial art differently, um, I think I just think that there's a lot to discuss here. So thank you very much for your patience. Um, I really look forward to our conversation. Thank you so much, Jack. That was extremely interesting. But I, I could just uh, start with, uh, I mean, you, you are a provenance curator. Um, do many more museums in, in Britain actually have a provenance curator employed? Um, that's an excellent question and the answer is no. I mean, the reality is that um, a lot of colleagues do really, really important work at museums in the UK, but they do this in addition to their normal tasks. So, for example, when museums decided in the late 1990s that the Nazi era provenance should be investigated, the expectation was that this should be done by curators who did not receive any funding to carry out archival research, who as art historians did not necessarily have the necessary background. They didn't get into this field because they wanted to research um, the dispossession of Jews in Nazi Germany, right? So it was a completely different skill set. They were very motivated, but they did not receive any support. And the reality is that what they could do was to just say, that there are gaps in the provenance. And most of the research was very reactive at museums. So museums then invested huge sums of money when there was a restitution claim, because then it was suddenly important to, to have a clear idea about the provenance of these cases. So they paid external consultants money to write comprehensive um, reports. Um, and in that way, the UK chose a different path than museum than 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 Germany, for example, or Austria, where there's a professional structure in place for this type of research. Um, and I mean, it applies to all the other um, fields as well, right? So when it comes to archaeological um, objects, it's 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 the same when it comes to for colonial art, there isn't a requirement to do any research really from from the government, and there, so it's it's just usually done by curators in addition to their existing roles. And I mean, it's they they are very busy people. They have to put together exhibitions, write catalogs. So I don't think that it's realistic at all to expect them to carry out um, this research. Museums have become much more conscious of these issues. So um, I shared this handout document um, with you. So we we check things against databases and so on. But the problem with databases is, of course, that they are not comprehensive, right? The UA was not in any database because nobody knew that it existed when it was sold. Uh, the the Frankel piece was uh, the, the clock was not in the database because it would require a family to write to a German organization to include something in the database. Um, and with uh, colonial art, it's mostly a communications issue, right? So nothing would prevent the museum from acquiring a Benin bronze today, which sort of regularly comes up at auction. The only reason why it doesn't happen is that museums are scared of the negative reaction in the media. Right. Um, so that's uh, the short summary of of of, of these issues.
Thank you. We we have a question from Susan. Nicker. Yes. Hello. Thank you for your lecture. I hope you can hear me. Yes. And um, you mentioned that you have been in contact with the museum in Frankfurt, and you also mentioned that there has been or that there is a more or less professional structure in Germany and in Austria concerning uh, Nazi uh, um, stolen art and objects. Uh, can you um, tell something about your experiences about the, the um, cooperation with uh, the uh, German institutions uh, in this issue? Yes, um, so maybe as, as a bit of background, so Germany always had an organization that was interested in stolen cultural property, but this organization was focused on cultural property that was stolen by Red Army soldiers after the Second World War. So it was about objects that were stolen from German museum collections as a form of reparations and then taken to Russia. And then with the Washington Conference, they thought, okay, let's expand this existing structure and let's let let them provide funding to museums to carry out this research. So a museum can apply for funding. They make a case. They say, we, we, we have no idea what's in our collection. Could we please hire a provenance researcher with your support? And that will then be possible. A problem that I found in my collaboration was that these are often fixed term contracts. So the researchers are only at the institution for a fixed number of years. So when you then try to reach out to them five years later with a specific question, um, you either get no response or you get a response from somebody who says that they are terribly sorry that the person has left and that they can't help you. And I think it's very important to think about um, so of the long longevity and sort of the sustainability of this of this research and the um the research output is is centrally collected in germany which is which is very very useful so every museum which received funding publish uh, sort of releases their reports which you can then take a look at um which was never the case in the uk so um it's possible that in 1998 somebody did a huge amount of research into the Frankels. There would be no way for me to know. So I think it's very important to think about how this research can be preserved and made accessible. And you asked me about um, about sort of my experience with um, with the collaboration with them. I had very positive experiences and the one with Frankfurt was probably my most positive one. But I think it's also important to share that I had some negative experiences where museums are still a bit scared that it will result in negative publicity for them. But I think that's more or less a thing of the past. I think the current generation of directors and um, curators has adapted to the fact that um, they are not responsible for what happened in the past, but that they are responsible for researching and addressing it. Right. Um, a problem with the collaboration is also that they are often able to tell me that there are particularly interesting files in archives, but they ca of course can't do their research, the research for me. So it's very important that there is a structure in place that enables researchers to request photocopies, to travel to archives and so on. And I'm only able to do this because I receive very generous financial assistance from the Gilbert Trust, which means that I basically don't have to worry about the costs of my research, which can be enormous sometimes because some German archives, they charge 50p per page. Right. And if you don't exactly know what you want to, if the file will be relevant, that can be very, very um, difficult. But in general, um, very positive and particularly positive because not only is there a government backed institution, but there's also an association of provenance researchers um, called the uh, Provenance Research Working Group, um, which has, I think, some 200 or 300 members. And it's the most amazing community because provenance research only works if you share information with other people. And I often sort of scan files for researchers from elsewhere. And 
I think that in Germany it's particularly powerful. In other countries, I've never received a response from any organization or institution in Eastern Europe, and I can only speculate about the reasons for it. I've had the experience that American museums, when I just sent them an inquiry, I received a letter back from a lawyer who said, we acquired this legitimately, we can't help you, goodbye. So it's it really depends. But in, I think in Germany and Austria, it, it's particularly um, it's particularly good when it comes to collaborations. With uh, the things you said just now in mind, would you say it should be an idea to to set up a European structure for this research? Because there are many other museums in Europe, some probably have the same problems, not only in, in Germany and Austria, and maybe even in in the UK. And uh, could it be an idea to to ask ICOM Europe to help with something like that? I think that would be excellent, an excellent idea because it would also sort of eliminate the language barrier because sort of it's very difficult to participate in the provenance working group if you're not if you don't speak German. Um, the um, I think with, with these sort of it, it's a great idea because it addresses the fact that researchers in different countries actually carry out the same research because they come across the same collectors in different institutions. And you can see this when you go to the archives because sometimes archives have these sheets which tell you who else looked at this file, right? And you often see that other colleagues have also looked at this. So I think it, it would make sense um, to set up something like this. But um, I mean, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't know how British museums would feel about this with Brexit and, and, and so on. I really can't, can't tell. But I think it's also important not to wait for a sort of European superstructure to come along. I think it's really important that individual countries take this incredibly seriously and think about how this can be done properly um, instead of waiting. And I mean, often sort of one argument that often works with people who are not convinced that we should just research this because we think it's important. One argument that often works is that it's a requirement, right? If you want to send an object from your collection to America as a loan, you might want to apply for immunity from seizure, for example. And to be able to apply for immunity from seizure, you need information about, the, you need to have done something um, as part of your application. Um, in the UK, the objects are only insured if, if, if research has been carried out. And the reason is simply that the UK government doesn't want to pay insurance to somebody who bought an object illegally. Right? So, if they're, so they're, 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 there are existing reasons for taking this research seriously. So as part of the due diligence that that are very sort of concrete and almost administrative and that that are not sort of part of the research into into um, collections. So uh, maybe it should be uh, instead of waiting for this icon structure uh, of the superstructures uh, you have mentioned, maybe it would be easier to 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 work for a, a European network of uh, uh, provenance researchers. I think that would be would be a wonderful idea, and I okay. think um, I, I completely support it. And um, I can't see you on the screen anymore, but maybe we can continue our conversation via via email at some at some point about this, because I know that colleagues in America are also thinking um, about this. So please, if you could drop me a line afterwards, that would be absolutely fantastic. We have a connected uh, question here in the chat. Uh, how is the um, dialogue uh, between museums in the UK concerning provenance research and research results? Um, it's it's very good. Um, it's we have a working group um, that um, doesn't meet as frequently as it used to, but that almost doesn't matter because people are sort of connected anyway. So if there's a particular issue, 
at a museum in the UK, it often affects other um, collections as as well. And so we all know each other, so we um, get together and coordinate to ensure that we don't carry out in the, that we don't individually carry out the same research. And again, so if it's the collaboration and but I do have to say it's it's quite informal. It's sort of it's existing networks um, of of colleagues. Um, and there is the spoliation working group, which is very important because um, once you have set up an official body, then there's the expectation that the this body meets and produces outcomes. So it's a great way for holding museums accountable because otherwise I think it's a possibility that, you know, sort of there these, these debates come and go. I think, I think if they had not set it up, then they would have talked about Nazi era provenance issues for two years or three years maybe, and then they would have talked about something else. But by establishing this clear structure, which is held accountable yeah, by outside bodies, I think that was a great idea to ensure that continuity. And to give you another example um, where this didn't happen, it never happened for colonial era art. So we had a lot of debate in the 1970s and the 1980s about these issues. And if you look at what was written at the time and you just swap out the dates, you could think that it was written yesterday, right? So if they were thinking about the same issues, but, and then it ha happened again in the 1990s and then recently with Macron and so on. But um, they never set anything, they never put any formal structure in place. So it means that the debates always start from the beginning, more or less. And then a great deal of energy, I think, is wasted. And, uh, and I think it's the, 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 the loss of institutional memory is extraordinary. I mean, once the people have left the museum, all the knowledge goes with them. And that's something that I found fascinating when I discovered discussion, minutes of discussions from the 80s about our Ethiopian collections. Yes, we have a question from Maria Dahlström. Hi, uh, thank you for a very interesting talk, Jacques, and uh, I will get in touch with you as well, uh, because I work here at the National Museums of World Culture with similar collections like me and I, and I'm doing provenance research on them, and well, it takes a lot of time. And uh, in fact, uh, Susanne, as you were talking about uh, uh, getting a, a sort of provenance network going, that's why I'm here today with three colleagues in the museum business, because we have also identified the need for a uh, to start with a national collaboration among regarding provenance research. And as you say, Chuck, the, the same people has been involved in buying and selling and trading objects in Europe mainly. They, so they, they pop up all the time, really. Mm. But I, 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 was, I was curious about this, um, uh, the, the Turkish object. Now you were lucky enough to establish uh, the provenance and where it came from, but what would you have done with it had you not been able to establish that it came from Turkey? What would that's that's so that's, that's a it? that's a very good question, and you are absolutely right that this was a a case where once you once I opened the file, all the play uh, all the puzzle pieces fell into place, right? And that's often not the case. I mentioned that we have hundreds of thousands of objects with where we have nothing substantial about the provenance. And I think the way to do it is to be is, is like what we do for the Nazi era objects where we communicate openly what we know and what we don't know. And I think in the past museums were embarrassed to admit that they don't have the full picture. And I think that that was a deeply wrong move because it created the expectations that museums know everything so for outside observers and so every time they didn't know something it created a big scandal and it was bad for the museum i think that museums need to explain and it's quite simple they didn't care the, the vna didn't care about who owned the objects in the past because it was a museum that wanted to collect examples of good design they didn't care who owned it in the past unless it was sort of a uh, a, an influential 
um, collector or, or particular significant taste maker. So I think the way to do it is to just be honest about the gaps and to say that, and also to explain that this could mean different things. It could mean that there's a problem. It could also mean that there isn't a problem and that we don't have a record because nobody thought that it was worthwhile to keep records. And yeah, so it's about transparency and about explaining to people what the limits of our knowledge are. I think that's the key keep it. And um, the concrete question, what if we hadn't known anything about this object? Then the honest answer is that it would still be in the Gilbert collection. Because we would not have any sort of concrete evidence to go by. So the honest answer would be we would probably have acknowledged that it likely came from Turkey. But um, there would have been less of a um, pressure or so felt pressure to return the object. But in this case, we had an antiquities dealer who had nothing to lose after he came out of prison and he said, OK, let me write this book. Um, I won't hold anything back. And then what do you I mean? That it doesn't leave much room for interpretation in this case. Thank you. We have uh, similar issues here and uh, I recognize all this about museum being embarrassed about what they have in their collections and how they came there. And I think uh, there's a, I mean, there's finally a big shift in the museum sector now to sort of be more transparent and open with the collection uh, and to um, to study the problematic provenances and how ex exactly objects came into the collections. And I think also it's also very important to uh, for a museum to to review their acquisition policy to make sure that they don't collect objects with a unknown provenance today. That, that's, that, that's, that's a great point. Can Gabriella, do you mind if I comment on, on acquisition policy? Okay, brilliant. Um, so we also review our acquisition policies every three years, right? And there are always sort of new concerns. So, so recent concerns are objects from Syria and, and North Iraq and so on that we that we that we are con conscious of. But um, the problem is that we have these policies and they all sound very good. So it sounds good that 1970 is now this cutoff point. But the reality is that that leaves. Um, so it only really became a requirement in the UK in 2000 where it became a government requirement. So you have 30 years where it wasn't an, a requirement. And I often find that when I talk to potential donors, they don't understand this. They didn't keep the records because the standards for private collectors are completely different, right? So if you can, you can go on an auction website and buy unprovenanced antiquities right now if you have the money, right? So, um, I think that that museums also need to communicate to collectors that if they want to give objects to the museum, if they want to see their name on the wall in the museum, they need to sort of keep the records or ask questions about it. And I would say that sort of a controversial opinion of mine maybe is that sometimes it is better if problematic objects end up in a museum and if they don't disappear in private collections. Um, and as long as the museums are open about this and that they, as long as they are open to returning objects. So I think that a museum could could say, for example, we don't have any provenance information, but I don't think that it should necessarily prevent them from acquiring these objects. If they are open about the provenance and if they are open to returning them when new information comes to light because often the time frame for acquisitions I mean I'm I'm, I'm sure you, you know this sometimes a curator spots something at an auction and you have two days to think about the status of the object right and that is of course not enough to to carry out um, provenance um, research but I mean maybe we can we can um, we can exchange our acquisition policies, maybe that would be, and due diligence policies, maybe that would be um, a useful idea. Thank you so much.
And um, yeah, definitely um, change, uh, exchanging uh, policies and, and learning from each other is, um, I think, extremely important. And as Maria mentioned, um, you have uh, identified the need for some kind of uh, uh, more cooperation, some kind of network for provenance issues. So um, um, and we're we're glad glad to be part of that as well in in Sweden. Um, as for today, our time is uh, uh, has already run out, I think. But this was very extremely interesting. Thank you so much, Rack. Thank you very and much for, for, for having me. And if you would like to um, continue the um, conversations, please feel free to send me um, an email. And I'm really happy to um, exchange documents. I think for me it would be tremendously um, interesting to see a Swedish uh, due diligence policy or acquisition collecting policy. I think it would be, I will translate it with Google, um, but very be very, very interesting. Thank you very much. It was a fantastic discussion. Thank you.